we've uh, been in the first four chapters for how long? A couple of weeks, yeah, seven years. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, one uh, young man came up to me after the service last week, and, or last service, and said, I can't believe how much information you draw out of a couple of verses. Uh, but it's such as the nature of the Word of God, right? The more you peer, the more you see. Uh, and so it's amazing what God has said. So we've been peering a lot into the first four chapters. If you summed up the first four chapters, it'd be pretty simple. In the first four chapters, Paul, writing to the Roman church, basically tells them, if you're a Jew or a Gentile, you're born under sin. You cannot save yourself, if you're, no matter what you do. Uh, religious works, lineage, how godly your parents were, etc. That's the first four chapters. You have to be justified by what? Faith. That's the big terminology in the first four chapters. Justification, legal term in that day, uh, courtroom term that you bring in the guilty party. When the gavel comes down, that the, the record has been expunged. That is justified. They're justified. Uh, in God's courtroom, the sinner is brought in there at the moment of faith. And Jesus brings the gavel down and says to the Father, they're forgiven. What saved them? Not their works, but their faith. What are the benefits of that situation? Uh, Paul, who used to be... Um, heavily steeped in Judaism, which was belief in God plus faith to get saved. Um, uh, Paul was just based upon my works to get me in. But now he's saved and he understands I, I must be saved by faith, justification by faith. Uh, the wonder of that uh, uh, has captivated Paul's heart. And so when, he, when you get to chapter 5, he's going to wax eloquent on the benefits of being a believer who believes in the Messiah. So this is the question we're going to look at. What are the benefits of believing in Jesus the Messiah? Paul's going to share in chapter 5. The very first word that he uh, opens with is one that when you take a Bible study methods class, uh, they, they always tell you when you see the word therefore, ask a simple question. What's it there for? You've all been to seminary. It's amazing. Uh, why, why is it there? Uh, why is it there? Because it's a transition from, I've just told you that you can't save yourself. You can only be saved when you're justified by your faith in the right object, Jesus, his person and work. Uh, and now I want to tell you uh, all the wonderful benefits of being a believer beyond that. He just can't help but help himself. So that, that's why the therefore is there. It's turning in a whole new direction. And he says uh, in, in verse 1 of chapter 5, therefore having been justified by faith. Uh, I know it's early in the morning. Uh, that phrase is a key grammatical thing that we need to look at. Uh, to be justified by faith uh, is a present tense ongoing thing. You're not justified today. Oh, you blew it tomorrow. Oh, you blew it right now. You need to get re-justified. No, it's something that is ongoing in God's courtroom. That's why I believe in eternal security. Uh, God's doing the justifying. And it's an exact phrase. And it's, it's, a, it's a participle. I know it's early, but we study grammar. Why? Because the grammar is anointed of God, right? So there's a reason why he put a participle here. And there's a reason why he chose a passive participle for justification as opposed to a, an active participle. And you're sitting there thinking, what is the difference? Like, who cares? I care, so I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> because it's important. So let's think about it. When he says, uh, therefore, having been justified, this participial phrase, uh, it's not the active tense. Because it's if the active tense, the subject, me, is doing the justifying. Is that what he's been talking about in the first four, four chapters? No. So he chooses the passive, tent, passive uh, uh, voice here to say the subject's being acted upon. Who's doing the action? God. At what moment? The moment of faith. He does the justifying. Very important why he chose the passive as opposed to the active. And he's going to tell you, therefore, being uh, justified, um, we are justified, he says in a prepositional phrase, by faith. Uh, that can be classified in one of two ways grammatically. Either ones go with it. Uh, it can be uh, we, are, uh, we are justified by means of faith or by the manner of faith. Either way, to get right in God's courtroom with the holy God, you got to come by faith. you got to come by faith. He says, we have this. Paul says, I, there's so much I want to tell you, Paul says. I, I'm, let me click down through him like an attorney. That's exactly what he's going to do. He's proved his case, first four chapters. Now he's going to turn and talk about the benefits of this, and he's going to systematically go through them. Aren't you glad Paul is very systematic in his, his speaking? You ever try to follow a preacher, and you're wondering, where is he going? Not doesn't happen here. Like, what is he talking about? <laughs> Here's what Paul talks about. The benefits of being a believer. Verse 1. What's the first thing that he says? We have what? Peace. Who do we get it through? See the preposition? Through. Uh, by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, which means you don't get peace with God by any other means. Now, the world has not got the memo, as we've talked about uh, in the first four chapters, because all false belief systems, when it comes to religion, 
I've told you all the components of them, but when it comes to salvation, it's all the same. You have to, they all teach you have to believe in God, whoever he or she may be, and you have to work to please that God. And you never know if you've done enough to please that God until the day that you see him, and you might come up short. So we've gone through all that in detail. Paul, Paul says when you come to God by definition of faith, uh, the first thing you have as a believer is shalom, peace. You have peace. Uh, when you became a Christian, did, you, did your life go south after that? I mean, did it become more difficult to be uh, walking on the planet before? I'm talking about externally. I mean, did things start happening to you? I mean, I've, I've seen this happen to so many people when they become a Christian. And if you ever tell a person, a non-Christian, a non-Christian who trusts Christ as their Savior, if you ever tell them, just trust Jesus and everything's going to be easy, no adversity, no trials, you're going to cruise into glory. True or not true? Not true. Not true. Not true. Uh, be honest. Paul says you have peace. He's not talking about external peace. He's talking about internal peace. He says you have peace in your soul. Like what peace? What kind of peace, Paul? The peace that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're right with God. That, that, that if you were to die, you would be immediately in his presence. That, that kind of peace. Peace that no longer does his wrath rest upon you. Peace that no longer is a barrier between you and him. Peace. He says, we have peace with God. It's a perpetual present tense verb. It's ongoing. That no matter what happens in your life, you lose your job, you get divorced, a child goes wayward, no matter what happens. Paul says, nothing can shake the inner peace that you have, that God is always with you no matter what. As Darren's been saying in the songs we've been looking at, you have peace. He says, you have this peace through, which is a preposition, through only one uh, individual, through your faith relationship of of Christ Jesus. That's, he's the means by which you get into the presence of God. I, uh, when you speak multiple times, you forget what you said, like on a given Sunday morning. So, uh, and I know that I told you this, uh, some, some service I said this, so I know that I am at 60 year old repeating myself, okay? So don't go, I totally heard that before, okay? Because I know I'm doing it. <laughs> I'm just saying don't tune me out when I tell you this because it's too important. I, I mean, I, could think, I can think of other illustrations, but it's so fresh, so emotional. I have to share it with you, and I don't think I shared it with all the services the last time I talked about it. Here's a picture of my sister Marla that passed away two days after Easter. Godly, godly woman. This is a picture that they took of her not long before she passed away, and she put on a wig because um, she didn't have any hair because of the chemo. She had three forms of ovarian cancer, statistical anomaly. She was a health food nut. And she looked at me one day and said, Marty, how could this happen to me? You know, but she uh, was a spiritual trooper through the whole ordeal. Uh, even checked herself into a hospice house the day after I flew and left her. Liz and I saw her one last time. Uh, so they took her at the bottom of the staircase of her home. Uh, uh, it was a good day for her. Took, took a picture. When she was dying of ovarian cancer, she was comatose uh, in the hospice house. Uh, you know, out of it, basically. Uh, but still communicating and saying things, uh, but out of it, eyes closed and everything. Uh, a couple days before she died, she, uh, she, who used to be a professional singer out of Nashville, was on the 700 Club and all those, sang with Andre Crouch, uh, back if you remember him, uh, a, a godly, godly woman. Uh, one day, my little sister was sitting in there with her, and she broke in, she's comatose, and she broke into singing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory to mine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. You know, the, you know the chorus? This is my story. This is my, what? This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior for this cancer all the day long. Why was she singing what she have? Hope, peace peace in her soul, that, that even though she was there, never going to check out of that place, that there was going to come the moment, the last breath, she would be transitioned immediately into the presence of God Almighty. She had, she had that peace. Do you have that peace? Do you have that peace? It's possible to have that kind of peace. Uh, my little sister sat there with her cell phone and filmed my sister singing. And she asked me the other day, do you want me to send that to you? I told her, I, I think I'll wait. I, I can't watch it. You know how that is? I mean, maybe later, but I just, I, I don't think, I, I, I know I need to watch it, but I'll, later. 
But I have it in my heart and mind that, wow, what bravery in the face of death itself. Where'd that come from? Justification by faith leads to what? Peace in the inner man, peace. Second thing that you get as a believer, verse 2, through whom we have also obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. That's the New American Standard. Uh, the NIV changes one of the words a bit. Through whom we have gained access, not introduction, by faith into his grace in which we now stand, and we boast in hope in the glory of God. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, those are two diametrically opposed concepts, introduction and then access, because uh, one is like a point in time thing. The other one's like, eh, it's kind of perpetual. Uh, and what is the deal with this particular Greek word? Well, if you study it lexically, it's, it can be both of these nuances. It can be introduction or it can be access. And, uh, and so I put this into my note. The second thing that you receive as a believer, the first thing is what? Peace. What's the second thing? Introduction and access. These two things are yours. Uh, the lexical meaning of the word is brought out by William Barclay, who's really uh, totally appropriate on his analysis of the word. He says this word historically had two lexical connotations. Number one, uh, it, it was normally used of introducing someone into the presence of someone greater than them, like an ambassador. If you're an ambassador and they're going to present you uh, to the president and you're from some other country, they're going to say, Mr. President, the, the ambassador from Burke or whatever. Not that we have one. Don't, don't freak out. Okay. But if, if such, they would have to announce you. So it's that kind of announcement. It's an introduction. Uh, or the other connotation is, is a mariner's kind of term, and it referred to a ship coming into a harbor from a storm, that you have access to a harbor of safety from a storm. You have access. Oh, I like that one. I like the other one, too. So I went with both of them lexically. I couldn't make up my mind. Uh, they're both true. Who, who has even thought about what God has given you at the moment of salvation? When you're declared righteous in God's courtroom, he's given you two things there, introduction and access. Who introduced you to the Father on his throne? Are you with me? Jesus did. Think about the day when Jesus walked, you know, in the presence of the Father and said, I mean, for me, it was 1967 when I was nine, when, you know, when the Father is on the throne and Jesus walks in the throne and says, Father, I, I've got a, a, another uh, son who's being introduced today. And the Father's, what was his name? Well, this is it's Marty. It's Marty introduction. You've been introduced to the Father yet? Isn't that awesome? That God Almighty takes the time out to listen to the introduction of the son of a, of a new son or a new daughter. But the other is also true. He also gives you access, that you can have access to the throne of God anytime. Why? Because your son gave you access. I, I find great solace in both of those two terms uh, through going through difficulties of life because you know that you, can, you are introduced God doesn't look down and go, Marty who? No, 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 no. We were introduced back in 1967. And he also says, you can come before my throne because you have access. Hebrews 4.16, a uh, very famous passage, says this. Let us as Christians therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Why? That we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. How many times I have run into that throne room, like with my sister. God, you got to help me. God, you got to help her. God, you got to help my brother-in-law. And now that she's passed away, God, you've got to really help my brother-in-law. I mean, et cetera, et cetera. Going into that throne room and praying, and he says, you're going to find God's going to help you there. Why? Because he's your, he's your father. You're your son. Jesus made it possible for you to go into that place. Uh, when I arrived uh, in uh, Southbridge at the, at the uh, conference center, uh, I, I don't think I'm going to know anybody when I walk in. And so I walk in, and I'm, I no sooner walk in the door, you know, soldiers all over the place. Uh, and uh, somebody goes, hey, Pastor Marty. <laughs> I don't know the guy. Yeah, you, well, he goes, remember me? Uh, no. <laughs> well, you baptized my daughter. Uh, sorry, I don't remember. Uh, you sent my other daughter on a mission trip. Uh, I don't remember that either. Uh, I mean, I'm 60. I mean, what? I mean, it just happens. You know, I mean, so many parishioners, I don't remember. But uh, then it started dawning on me who this was. It's like, oh, yeah. Uh, and I was running into people all over the place who were pastoring, uh, you know, they were chaplains at Fort Bragg. They're all over the place. So they were all coming up to me. And then it finally dawned on me how many people in the military this church ministers to. Shocking, but awesome. And we had a great, had a great week. But on Monday night, we had a, like a dinner thing, uh, and it was kind of a get-together. So it's a room full of colonels and a bunch of generals, and me. I'm like, really? So uh, uh, General Soljum, uh, the one star, uh, said he came over to me. He goes, hey, I, I want you to introduce you to the two star. 
uh, General Hurley. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, so he walks me over there, and there's this huge Green Beret guy standing there. I know he's a Green Beret because I asked him. He was huge. Uh, and then there was an aide, you know, like next to the, the general. And so he walks up and introduces me, you know, General Hurley, I'd like to introduce you to, you know, Dr. Baker, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I, you know, introduced myself. I didn't overshake his hand. I tried to be just firm and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's always complaining about the grip. And so I shook his hand and introduced myself. We had a nice little talk. Uh, talked to the Green Bay, really nice guy. He didn't kill me. But this would not be the kind of situation if I just walked in there on my own, because I could see the general over there. I mean, I, I'm an introvert anyway, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to just boldly walk in and go, hey, what's up, General? Me, Marty. Hey, I know we haven't met, been in your office many times. You're never there. Uh, you're always out traveling. Uh, great to see you. Are, you think I'm going to do that? Would you do that? Would you? I wouldn't. What's proper protocol? Wait. So I just hung around the coffee bar. I'm just waiting. The General comes over and takes me over there and introduces me. I'm introduced. So then later in the week, when I keep running into the general, the two-star, I don't feel, I'm not afraid, like, to have a conversation. So one day, I'm in the cafeteria talking to this army professor. We're having, everybody cleared out of the cafeteria to go to classes. We're sitting there at a table, uh, and here comes General Hurley. I'm like, oh, no. Like, what? You know, and he sits down next to us, and there's this army professor sitting there and me. And so he sits down, and, and he's looking at me, and I, I said, uh, do, do you want me to leave now? <laughs> He goes, no, I, want, I need to talk to you. Oh, really? Like about what? He goes, well, I just want to know after, after all that you've seen as an outsider, you're not in the army, what, as an outsider, what have you seen that we're doing well? And what are you seeing as an outsider that we need to improve on? I looked at him and I said, you, you really want me to answer that question? That's scary stuff, isn't it? I do this stuff for a living, speaking. But because I was introduced properly to the general, I felt freely uh, to speak. It was awesome. We had a great time, fellowship. See, Jesus has introduced you to the Father, so you're not afraid to walk into his presence anymore. It's a perpetual thing. He says, uh, we have been introduced, we have confidence. He says, we have gained access by, uh, faith, by, uh, by faith into his grace in which we now stand. That's a, that's a perfect tense verb, which means nothing to you probably, but it means, in Greek, it's unusual. It means a past act with an abiding result. Again, that's why I believe in eternal security. He says, it's what we stand in perpetually. You stand in that place. And he says, and we boast and we hope in the glory of God. So you have two things that we've seen so far. You have the first thing that you have as a believer is, is the test. You have peace. You have peace. Peace. What's the second thing that you have? You have access and you have introduction. Third thing that you have, verse 2. We've made it to verse 2. Verse 2. He says, and we boast, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. We boast in hope in the glory of God. What's the third thing that you have? Well, you can pick out the key word. Hope. I have, what's the first thing? Peace, introduction and access, and then I have hope. Like hope, hope in what? Seeing the glory of God. I mean, his holiness is so bright that when you see him in the Old Testament, when there's a theophany, when God shows up, he's always enshrouded in clouds. Because if there were no clouds shielding us from him, you'd be vaporized. Uh, you have to go back to Exodus chapter 24, verse 16. When uh, old man Moses went up to the mountain. It says, the glory of the God of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called out to Moses from the midst of the cloud. Into the eyes of, unto the eyes of the sons of Israel, the appearance of the glory of God was like a consuming fire on a mountaintop. I've been out in Sinai before. I don't think in the years I've been down there, I've ever seen a cloud. Because it does not rain there. Kind of today, it's looking like a good place to move to. There's, there's no rain. It doesn't rain there very often. So to have clouds surrounding one local mountain... And there's two million of you former slaves based around the, that mountain. And an old man Moses hikes up there. And all you see is a cloud bank descending on that one mountaintop. And for six straight days, it doesn't move. And on the seventh day, you're hearing a loud, booming voice. And you're seeing this light pulsating and lightning. And there's earthquakes. And it's God. How did the people feel about that when they saw the glory of God shielded by a cloud bank? Well, it says in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 22 to 27, and if you think the Bible is boring, you haven't read the Torah. Read the Torah. Case in point. When the people saw all this, they're going to go to Moses uh, with a request. Uh, and I find this interesting. Their request comes in verse 24. 
Behold, they say to Moses, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness in a shielded format. And we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. We have seen today that God speaks with man like you, yet he lives. Now then, why should we die? This is interesting. Uh, For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer, then we shall die. This is really interesting. For where, who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Now, here's the request of the leader. Moses, what do they want him to do? You go near. You, you go over there. <laughs> you climb up there. And you hear all that the Lord our God will speak unto you. Uh, and uh, then we'll hear of it. You go. What did they not want to see? the awesomeness of the glory of God. It was too scary in their, in their physical body. They're like, Moses, the voice just, I mean, rattles my bones. I mean, God intersected in the time and space and we've seen where we've heard him. We've heard the, the trumpet of the angel. We felt the ground move as God speaks and there's a localized earthquake. We've seen the fire and the lightning and Moses, uh, we don't want to handle that right now. Glory of God. The glory of God is an awesome thing. Matthew chapter 17. That's an interesting passage, isn't it, about leadership. You as a leader, go do the hard thing. We'll sit back and watch. Go have fun. Matthew chapter 17, Peter, James, and John are taken up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, you got to love what happens up there. It's awesome. And again, if you think the Bible is boring, you haven't read it. They get up there. Uh, it says six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brought them up to a high mountain by themselves. They think it was Mount Tabor, which is in the Jezreel Valley, conal shaped the mountain on the, like the north uh, eastern shore uh, uh, rim of the valley of Jezreel took him up there by themselves and he was transfigured before them his face shone like the sun his garments became as white as light I mean Jesus showed Peter James and John I'm Messiah I'm the Messiah I'm Christos I'm the anointed one I truly am here's the Shekinah glory of God you gotta love Peter (laughs) oh sorry I love this passage Peter Peter looks at the situation and says this is the understatement of all of scripture Lord, it is good for us to be here. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? He's in the glory of God? And then they fell down to worship Jesus because he was the Shekinah glory. Um, Matthew 24, Jesus says on the judgment day at the end of the tribulation, it says in verse 30 of Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, at the end of the tribulation, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn. All those people who reject the Christ as Messiah, they're going to see him. Then it's too late. And they will see the Son of Man, code word from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, I believe, of Jesus. They will see him coming in the clouds uh, of the sky with great power and with great glory. That's the Shekinah glory of God. They're going to see the glory of God. You're going to see the glory of God as a believer or as an unbeliever? Uh, when I was flying back last week, I, uh, I think uh, I, I landed in Connecticut. Is it Hartford, is that... Yeah, it was, I, I've never been up here. It was all new to me. I was having a great time. Um, and uh, uh, when I was flying back, it was uh, at sunset. Uh, here, I'm going to show you a picture. You ever have those moments? I've asked pilots among us, you ever have those moments when you're flying in your fighter jet or whatever, when you just look out the window and just, you're just stunned by the awesomeness of God? The answer is always yes. You know, flying along, we'll get out the window thinking about how great the conference went, how many great conversations we had, to see God working in the, in the U.S. Army chaplaincy program to, to grow them up into a greater uh, chaplains. I mean, just to hear all the stories. I mean, I couldn't see that and not think of the glory of God. And so I prayed for quite a while, flying through the clouds back to D.C. Thank you, God, for how great you are. You ever see that and be moved mystically to thank God for one day... When you draw your last breath as a believer, you have the hope of what is yet to come. You, you will be one who will see his very presence. You ready for that? Uh, lastly, he says, uh, as a believer, uh, you get uh, one more thing. And we need to review because we test here at our church. So as a believer, you have benefits. So what is the first thing that you get? You have peace, shalom, in your, in your inner being that nothing can take from you. Second thing, you have access and introduction into his presence perpetually that can never be taken from you. Third, if hope, hope that one day I shall see the glory of God Almighty. 
I mean, that's what my sister saw. That's what Liz's twin sister saw when she died of cancer at 33. First thing was the glory of God. And then lastly, he throws in verses 3 to 5. He says, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. You know, I read that this week and I thought, really? I mean, Paul, are you kidding me? Uh, What he's going to tell you is uh, God gives you as a child new perspective in your trial. He didn't say, I'm going to deliver you from a trial. He's going to give you a new perspective in your trial. I know we we wax eloquent on God, deliver deliver me from all of these trials and adversities. God looks down from heaven and says, I'm sovereign in all of those. I don't always deliver. Sometimes he does, uh, but sometimes he uses those to, to shape and to hone our character. That's what he's concerned about. Uh, he says here, and not only this, but we exult in our tribulations. Do you exult in your tribulations? I mean, when your life goes south as a believer, is that the first thing you think in your mind when they tell you we're terminating your contract? This is the last day of your job. When the doctor comes in and says the report's not good, Paul is saying we exult. Thank you for that awesome report. Really. Thank you for the fact my contract with the government's over. You might really be thank God for that. But (laughs) But Paul says we exult in our afflictions. I mean, think of all the things that happened to Paul. Spit on, beat on, stoned, left for dead, shipwrecked. He says, in all these things, my perspective is I exult in them. Why? Because he understands God is sovereign in all of those things. Uh, here's the Old Testament Paul would have known well. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 14. In the day of prosperity, be happy, but in the day of adversity, consider God has made one as well as the other. He's sovereign over both of those. Isaiah, though he's the one, God is the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. God is sovereign over the good and the bad. Why? To accomplish his purposes. Paul says, we exult in the tribulations. The word... Uh, Thalepsin in Greek means a a highly pressurized situation. I mean, one that you can feel it crushing you. Like when I was facing my sister's death, it was crushing sadness. What does God say? In the middle of that, I work. I work in the middle of that kind of stuff. To do what? Verse 3, knowing that tribulation brings about what? Perseverance. That word that, well, I don't like that word. Yeah, it brings about perseverance. Why? It's the Greek word hupomone, which means to hang on, you're not going to quit. When I was a baseball player my freshman year in high school, that, that was my sport, I went out with the wrestling team just to stay in shape. I would not suggest that. <laughs> After a couple practices, I couldn't feel my grip. I couldn't feel my calves. I'm sitting eating a plate of spaghetti one night. I couldn't lift my hands up to grab the fork. And my mom says, honey, what's the matter? You haven't had dinner. I cannot lift my hands to grab the fork. So my dad came home from work in his U.S. Customs uniform, his gun and everything. He sits down. He goes, hey, what's going on? I mean, you're not eating, you know? <laughs> and I said, Dad, I, I really think I, I, I just want to quit the wrestling team. Uh, my dad was from South Carolina. Deep bass voice, southern voice. Son, didn't raise no quitters here. <laughs> you're staying on that team. That's hupomone. No matter what that coach does to you, you're not in my family. You're hanging on. I never forgot that. It taught me much about myself. See, that's spiritual. Why does God say, I send you tough times? Why? So that you can learn how to persevere and not let go. That when a sibling's facing cancer, like Liz did with her twin sister back in 93, my sister just a few months ago, that no, when something is happening that's out of the realm of what you want, that you can say, but God, even in this, I will hang on. I will not let go. Because you're doing something great. He says perseverance is, is supposed to, according to verse 4, d- build into you proven character. Proven character. That is the Greek word for coinage being purified, like gold being purified. What's God concerned about? Burning the things out of your character that don't need to be there. Here's a prayer you should pray after lunch. God, take my character that I thought was stellar and burn out of it the things that I shouldn't have and use affliction and trouble to get my attention. Why are you laughing? You're chicken, right? You're not going to pray that. Because why? Because you know if you pray that, what's going to happen? He's going to do that. I got news for you. He's going to do it anyway. (laughs) He's going to do it. Why? He wants to grow up your character into Christ-likeness. He will use pain and tragedy to deepen you. He will deepen you. Uh, Don't be afraid to pray that because he does love you. And he will care for you, even in the middle of all that, to teach you much about yourself. 
He says, uh, this proven character leads to hope. Indeed, it does. And he says in verse 5, this hope does not disappoint. Why? Because the God of love has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That even though in the middle of all those things that you face, that he's honing and shaping you to be a greater saint, he's telling you, don't forget, I didn't just sprinkle hope into your life. I poured it in there. I poured it into your life. So that when you hug that sibling for the last time, it's sad, but it's also joyous. Why? Because you have hope. Hope in what lies ahead. And it wasn't just sprinkled in your life. God said, I took a pitcher of hope and I poured it in there that one day you shall see me face to face and all those in your family who loved me. This is not it. This is not it. You have that kind of hope? Is God working on your character? It's a benefit of being a believer is being shaped into his image. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the, the depth of this uh, passage. It teaches us much about the faith. It help us to embrace what you have taught here to accept what you're doing in our lives and to grow up in the faith and to be mature saints. And for those who don't know you, uh, might the benefits of salvation move them to the cross wherein they can find redemption.